Good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming to tonight's conversation with former Congressman Lee Zeldin, part of our Klinsky Leadership Series. It's no secret to those of us gathered here that New York faces profound challenges. With the support of Steve Klinsky, we at MI have convened leading public officials and policy intellectuals to think deeply and creatively about our city's future. So I'd like to extend a special thank you to Mr. Klinsky for his partnership. I'd also like to recognize our trustees Ravenel Curry and Nathan St. Amand and MI's distinguished President Emeritus Larry Moan, who are also with us here tonight. Thank you. I am honored and delighted to be joined on stage by Lee Zeldin, an officer in the US Army Reserve who served with distinction in the New York State Senate and most recently in Congress, where he developed a reputation as a dogged defender of his Long Island constituents. And last year, Mr. Zeldin did something few thought possible. He made a general election for governor of New York State highly competitive. In doing so, In doing so, he offered a fresh new approach to expanding the conservative coalition, and he may have changed the state's political map for years to come. While Joe Biden defeated Donald Trump by more than 20 percentage points in 2020, Mr. Zeldin narrowly lost the 2022 gubernatorial election by a mere six points, receiving the highest share of the vote for a Republican statewide candidate in 20 years. In New York City, he doubled the vote of the last GOP gubernatorial candidate from 15 to 30 percent, making deep inroads in diverse middle and working class neighborhoods throughout the outer boroughs. Mr. Zeldin has graciously agreed to talk with us about his race and the future of New York politics, about whether New York, the bluest of blue states, could become purple once again. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Mr. Zeldin, as you can tell, you're among friends here. Uh, so first, a quick question. There is a pattern among Republican governors who win in predominantly Democratic states. Think of Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, Larry Hogan in Maryland, Phil Scott in Vermont. The script is typically, you know, I am going to be your bulwark against a aggressively left-wing legislature, and I'm also going to distance myself from a national Republican party that you know, many folks in these states, independents, moderates, think of as too extreme as well. You, however, are someone who's always been a pretty rock-ribbed conservative. You were someone who distinguished yourself, you know, though you were from the Northeast, though you're from a suburban district, you were certainly not considered someone who was ever apologizing for being on the political right. So how did you think about that as you were gearing up to run statewide? You know, when you were looking at that, call it the Baker, Hogan, Scott model versus your record, who you are, how you've approached your political career. How did you think about that? Over the course of these elections, I would get asked, uh, a, are you this or that every two years? Are you a Tea Party Republican or are you a John Boehner Republican? And they ask me, are you a Ted Cruz Republican or a Pete King Republican? At the beginning of this campaign, I would get asked, are you a Charlie Baker Republican or are you a Ron DeSantis Republican? It's very important to be your own person. And there are ways that Republican candidates seek to earn the support of Democrats, not by doing a good job explaining why you're a Republican, why you have the views that you do, but acting like a Democrat light. And it leaves the voters with a choice between a Democrat or a Democrat light. Now, it might help you in winning more votes from Democrats, but the problem is, is that you are really uh, alienating many in your own base. They want to support someone who is going to be courageous in saving New York. They want somebody who's going to be bold with their ideas and their policies to be able to save our state. There are people on city streets who are being harmed and threatened, and they want to know that people in power are actually going to do something to secure our streets and our subways. We have young kids trapped in multi-generational poverty. Parents who want their kids to have access to a good quality school. You can't just talk about this from 30,000 feet. What are you going to do about it? And promoting school choice and lifting the cap on charter schools and, and, and having 
tax credits for school choice and educational savings accounts. Talk about it from the substance. Yesterday, there was a State of the State address that took place up in Albany. For any of you who watched it as, as I did, I see Michael Goodwin here from the New York Post. Some of you need to, that's part of your job. There were, there were topics that were briefly touched on where you, if you were there giving that speech for this governor, you would have delivered the substance that's needed to actually save this state, but instead you didn't get it. By saying that you know, we need to look at bail. <laughs> and then that's the end of it. We need to feel safe. That's the end of the conversation. What you would do if you were standing up there is saying that what we need to do to save New York is to declare a, a crime state of emergency and suspend cashless bail and less is more and raise the age and halt act and the discovery law changes. We need to give judges discretion to weigh dangerousness. We need district attorneys to do their job. DA stands for district attorney, not defense attorney. And I'm going to send an example to the, send a message to the rest of the district attorneys by removing the Manhattan district attorney, Alvin Bragg. Now, that's what I would have said if I was there yesterday. <laughs> and I think that when you, you get to the heart of this question of what kind of a Republican can, in fact, serve as governor of the state of New York, it's someone who's true to themselves. It's one who's out there earning the support by being themselves and understanding that in order to actually save the state, what people want is boldness and courage and substance. And I think that there's a lot of Democrats and independents who might even shock Republicans by being willing to vote for that Republican who's showing that backbone, that desire to restore balance and common sense to be able to get the job done. You've had a lot of time now to think about the race, think about the strategies that you used, you and your campaign used to try to overcome this very significant Democratic advantage in the state, it turns out that there was a very big Democratic advantage nationally as well that you were pushing against. Are there things that, in hindsight, you would have done differently? Are there constituencies that actually moved more than you expected? Are there places where you think that you, your campaign, the state party might have invested to yield a different result? Even though there was no red wave nationally, a red wave hit New York. A red wave hit Florida. And why that happened, and it didn't happen through the rest of the country, is one that would, should motivate all of us if we could go back in time to do a better job convincing Republicans nationally to deliver a red wave across the country. Why is it that a red wave hit New York, but it didn't hit the rest of the country? The Dobbs decision is something that gets referenced the Dobbs decision is a, a decision that was national. You can be on offense or defense, but sometimes these issues pop and you try to choose neutral. Sometimes neutral is not an option. The Dobbs decision happened. And here in New York, we couldn't just ignore it, and we addressed it on our terms. Nationally, if you want to create a, a red wave, the wave isn't created by your success in being opposed to the other side. In 1994, and, and speak, we're here, uh, you know, the generous support of Steve Klinsky, we happen to be uh, talking about this just a little bit earlier today. I, I shared this perspective of 1994. Haley Barber, chair of the RNC, Newt Gingrich, wanting to become the next Speaker of the House. They weren't just saying Bill Clinton's bad, the Democratic Party is bad, vote for me, and then... Therefore, a red wave hit nationally. There was a contract for America. There was one that the candidates knew what was in it, the media knew what was in it, the voters wanted it. They had their favorite components of it. It wasn't just Bill Clinton's bad, the Democratic Party is bad, so vote for me. If you want people to open up their heart and trust and the faith, the next level enthusiasm and, and momentum and, and motivation, that effort that you need to actually win a create a, a wave. It's not about what you're against. It's about what you're for. 
And if we could go back in time and change one thing, I would have tried to do a much better job to convince my colleagues nationally that there is no red wave coming unless, as I traveled around New York State, I said, I am able to guarantee you that we will win this race as long as all of us do absolutely everything in our power, telling everyone we know all in to get our message, working until the polls close on election night. Now, we did that in New York. And our rallies over the course of the last few days, last couple weeks, some of these rallies would not just get into the thousands, they would get into the many thousands. And the reason why, and I saw it, I, one time I had a chance to see a Leonard Skinner set standing on the stage. <laughs> and it was a different perspective, not just of the stage. I enjoyed the perspective of the audience. I was looking out at this crowd filled with hardcore Leonard Skinner fans. And there was something different about their face and their body language that, quite frankly, there might be some of you in this crowd, you might have been there that day, it wasn't quite normal. <laughs> it was, you're in like some other zone. When I was doing these rallies the last few days, the last couple weeks of the campaign, and I'm on the stage, and I'm looking out at the crowd, it wasn't normal. There were people who, there's some grown men in here who maybe haven't cried too much in their adult life. Then we have people like Boehner, <laughs> who probably <laughs> be crying just to, just to see me up here giving this, this speech with all of you. When a grown man cries for the first time in a really long time, and in that cry, they realize that they're crying, and they're shocked. They then start crying even more. There are people in New York State who hadn't had a chance to believe in a long time. And what they realized at the end of this campaign was that we have a real shot. And then that emotion of realizing how long it's been since the last time in New York that we were able to believe in New York, that we had a chance to save the state, got them even more emotional. If nationally, we were telling people, not just Joe Biden's bad, the Democratic Party is bad, but convincing them this is what you're going to get by electing a Republican Senate and a Republican House. This is what we are going to do to save America. I think we had an opportunity to get to that next level. We talk about plenty of other things, about ballot harvesting and early voting, and the list goes on. But if you're only allowed me to name just one thing, and it's not just about looking backwards, it's a lesson learned for going forwards. Waves don't just happen. If we catch anyone on a board before the polls close, trying to ride in a wave, knock them off the board. No one's allowed to ride a, a wave in. The waves are created by working to create the wave by telling people not just what you're against, but what you're for. And I think it was the biggest uh, missed opportunity of 2022. So one way of putting this is that you know, you're saying that the fact that the national party did not have a coherent, consistent, clear, practical, actionable message is something that weighed down a lot of talented candidates in kind of districts around the country. One thing that I find interesting about that is that there's another line of argument, which is that the problem for folks who are not part of the dominant political coalition in a state like New York or California is the excessive nationalization of our politics. That is, there used to be a time when you, know, you wouldn't vote straight ticket. You, know, you might vote one way for Congress, but here in New York City, you might vote for Rudy Giuliani, you might vote for Mike Bloomberg, but maybe you'll vote for a Democrat for Congress. Your view seems to be that, look, the nationalization is here, and therefore, if you want to win statewide, you need a more competent and effective national party and national message. Is that a fair characterization of your view? Well, certainly when you're running for a federal office, the race is nationalized. If you're running for state office, in many respects, our message was localized. We would talk at times about New York City specific issues, at times about New York State issues. Sometimes 
It's all intertwined. When people are asking me a question about migrants coming to New York City, what are you going to do about it? The solution isn't just about what does a blue city or red city mayor do? What does a blue state and red state governor do? Because quite frankly, if all the blue state and red state officials underneath the federal level were all working together to solve it, it actually wouldn't solve it. It's impossible. Because you have to do some things at the federal level to actually secure the entry process. There's a level of nationalization that, that infiltrates any level of campaigning. And it has to be really frustrating if you're running for district court judge and you get swept out of office despite being the very best district court judge in the history of district court judges. Yeah, and the issues in Albany, the issues at the local level, they're different than national issues. And, and in theory, you'd think you ought to be voting on the basis of those issues over which you have authority. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I, and I, I would say that the way our politics is, nationalization of these campaigns to a certain extent is um, determined before your race even starts. If there was a red wave nationally, we, we win the race. I mean, to think that we did as well as we did with there being no red wave nationally, can you imagine if there was one? There's, if you look at New York State, 22% of New York voters are Republican. We got 46, 47% of the vote. Uh, there are 3.3 million more Democrats than Republicans in New York. 3.3 million. They lost by about 300,000. We think that there are these tribes. People are in their corner. There's a, a, a red corner and there's a blue corner. But a whole lot of average people care about their family, their life, their job. They're going through a routine. When they turn on the news, they actually just want to know what they missed that day. They just want to know what the news is. And there shouldn't be some great mystery as to how to improve a business model to capture more of an audience. Well, what could, how could we do a better job of just telling people what they missed that day while they're focusing on their job? I think that uh, New York, even though it is a blue, the bluest of blue, it's you know, as blue as this backdrop, at the, <laughs> at the same time, uh, there are a whole lot of New Yorkers who just want what is best for themselves, their family, their community, their state, and their country. And there are people who want balance and common sense, and they realize that with a one-party Democrat rule, supermajority Democrat Assembly and Senate, the way to save New York, the way to change the trajectory of the state, the way to, the way to reverse the leading the whole country in out migration. If you want to enact the largest tax cut in the history of the state, if you want to make our streets safe and improve the quality of education in our schools, well, you know what? Even though I'm a Democrat, I've always voted Democrat my entire life. This year, I'm going to vote Republican because I want to save New York. And I think that there's a lesson to be learned when you look four years from now. You have to believe, and believing is going to get you about halfway there out of the gate. And if you don't believe, you're dead before you even launch the campaign. This is a parochial question from a lifelong Brooklynite. Um, so, you know, you hit around 30% of the vote in the five boroughs. What, if you had the resources, what were the things that you would have done to get that a bit higher, to get that to 35? Because, you know, first of all, you just made huge gains. But were there kind of marginal gains to be had if you, uh, you know, kind of had the funds, if you had the door knockers, you know, kind of, were there neighborhoods you would have targeted? I'm just kind of curious, you know, what was the thing that frustrated you in those last few days where you felt like, you know, you could have squeezed out a bit more? One respect, they were cramming for a final exam on the other side. They, they were not running a great campaign, but at the, the get out the vote operation at the end, they were getting the vote out. And it may not work for people who don't like these different politicians, but for Democrat voters deciding whether or not they need to come out, they saw Bill and Hillary, Joe and Jill, Kamala, Obama. I mean, I, I, was, I was getting hit from Leonardo, Mark Ruffalo, <laughs> Marissa Tomei, John Lake Guizamo, Cher, Cher, uh, they're all coming after me. 
Over the course of the last week, you see the Working Families Party getting engaged. You see some key labor unions getting engaged. Sometimes they say with these elections, it'd be really interesting uh, if, whether or not you would have won if there was just one more week. You saw police officers in the subway. This year. A nice change of pace. Yeah. This year actually would have been a better question of what would have happened if the election was one week earlier. <laughs> On our side, uh, the primary resulted in me spending a lot of time outside of the city. I wasn't really able to very heavily engage New York City until we got the June 28th primary behind us. I would say that for building up for 2026, instead of having a candidate going all in, busting their tail to get 30% of the vote in New York City, you need the Republican candidate to be able to get 35% without it requiring so much of their time. There's no way to win this race if you don't get 30%. We got 30%. But the problem was, was I had to spend so much time and effort to get to 30%, where over the course of these last few months, I wasn't going to other places where there were a lot of votes there too to be able to hit those marks. I would say that we need to build. Uh, fo focus on the New York City Council races. Um, I, I, I fear that those who are in charge right now, some of the policies that they enact, might be doing their, their job to help our cause four years with bad governance. I hope I'm wrong. But our side needs to build up over the course of the next uh, few years. Structurally, uh, we have to get into these communities when you're not asking for their vote. And I feel like a lot of our efforts are showing up in the, uh, the 11th hour. Okay, and one other thing of too course. briefly is and you're showing up in the black community, the Asian community, the Hispanic community. You don't show up and say, I love black people, vote for me. I love Asian people, vote for me. I love Hispanic people, vote for me. You're pandering. Show up and say, we need to improve the safety on these streets, here's how. We need to improve the quality of education in our kids' schools, here's how. So what we do to bridge this over the next four years is to show up and show up with substance, not to pander. And make sure that when you're actually asking for their vote four years from now, you actually built a relationship. And you don't feel like you're just some Johnny come lately, you're gonna show up right before the election, ask for their vote, and then they fear that once the election's over, you're, they're never gonna see you again. So tell me if this sounds right. Um, you know, you did give serious consideration to running for chair of the Republican National Committee. And what I'm hearing from you is this idea that we need a 50 state strategy. We need to actually play in places where we're not expecting to win necessarily, but we want to have a real party apparatus in these places where we haven't come to play before because that can pay dividends. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, and I would add one other point about this city example. It's not just about the votes you get in the city. And when the votes you get in the city are every vote you earn, it's actually two votes because it's one less vote for your opponent and one more for you. When I travel through the rest of the state, a lot of my campaigning, you're earning one vote because it's somebody who's either staying home or they're voting for you, but they're your supporter. But where you could flip a Democrat vote, in a way, you'd say it's two. You lose by 300,000 if you flip 150. It's not that you have to go out there and flip 300, right? Here's another thing. The media market isn't just New York City. Now these reporters inside of New York City, they're not gonna spend their day traveling all throughout the suburbs. But what we did was that we would show up in New York City, like every day, we would hit an issue that they have to cover in a place that's all too convenient. I'm not saying, hey, I'm in your media market, I want you to drive an hour and 20 minutes to be there at you know, 9.20 in the morning. I'm showing up to right where you work, right where you live, hitting an issue because somebody last night was stabbed at this subway station and they were murdered. And it was the fourth uh, knife attack in the last 10 hours. And they have to cover it. Now you'd say, well, for the people who live inside of New York City, this is, this is good. You're driving the conversation of the day. They know that you're out with solutions to make the city safe and the experience of riding on the subway safer. But there's something much bigger than that. The New York City media market covers two-thirds of New York's population. 
two-thirds of New York's congressional districts. It covers congressional districts in Connecticut. It covers congressional districts in New Jersey. Now, a status quo election, New York sends six uh, Republicans in our congressional delegation to DC. The result is that there would have been 218 House Democrats and 217 House Republicans. But instead, we won New York 1, New York 2, New York 3, 4, 11, 17, 19, all inside the New York City media market. We came within a point of winning New York 18. By the way, what we were doing in Syracuse helped win New York 22. That's a big Biden district. We ended up sending 11 Republicans down to DC. So now you're looking at it from a national standpoint. You're looking at this at a national standpoint. These cities all have suburbs. You want to win Pennsylvania? You can't ignore Philadelphia and say, oh, Philadelphia, we're going to get crushed. What's the point of spending all this time inside of Philadelphia? What, that we get 10% instead of 5%? Nah, I'm going to spend my time elsewhere. It's not just about the votes inside of Philadelphia. The media market is hitting all of these other suburban voters. And if you're not inside of Philadelphia, you're not driving the message of the people who are starting their day with their morning news, ending their day with their evening news, and getting caught up that the Republicans are fighting the good fight. There they were in Philadelphia again. No, actually what happens is quite the opposite. The morning news and the evening news is about how Barack Obama's back again. It's his fourth visit to Philadelphia in the last three weeks. Well, this isn't a turf that they just own, and it should be nationwide. Conservatives need to get inside of the cities, not just to flip votes inside of the cities, but to drive the messaging into the suburbs, because even if they don't live in the city, they care about the city. We did it in New York, and I would say it was proven to work in New York. If, if, if we were not spending all of this time in New York City during this campaign, we don't win some of these suburban districts. And by the way, not just in New York, we even flipped some Jersey seats inside the New York City media market. So you mentioned before outreach to ethnic minority voters. Uh, what I'm taking away from this is that um, you, know, you need to think about the indirect effects of campaigning in these areas. But also, part of what I'm hearing is that you can't treat certain areas as no-go areas. You can't assume that some constituencies, some communities are unreachable. That if you bring that attitude, uh, it is fundamentally a defeatist attitude. What you need to do is kind of imagine that everyone could be persuadable. Is that, is that kind of how you There is at? no better area to go to than an area where some high-paid political consultant is telling you to absolutely not go to. Why would I go to a subway station in Morris Heights after a knife attack? Where, by the way, somebody at the end of the press conference who was listening, I went up to say hi, the four of the cameras were rolling. I said hello, I didn't know what he was gonna say, I was just trying to be friendly before I leave. He said, in this area, we've given up on the government. If somebody wants to fight me, you just tell me when and where. You bring your knife, I'll bring my knife, and we'll settle it amongst ourselves. I went the day before the election to Co-op City in the Bronx. I don't know the last time that they've seen a Republican in Co-op City. They definitely don't see a Republican in Co-op City the day before the election. Now people say, why, why is it that with Democratic policies that these people keep voting Democrat? It's because the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. It's not that they're in love with Democrats. And they're not going to assume that you're any better. They have a problem with Democrats, but they believe that Republicans are worse. What are you going to do about it? Well, show up. You know what I found? They were waiting with open arms. Except for Co-op City, by the way, the day before the election. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't so happy to see me there. But I found through uh, many of these stops that they were waiting there with open arms. And the engagement, it was easy, it was productive, and it was just filled with this fertile electoral ground that you can't be waiting until the end of a race to go, to go feed. What you really need to be doing is, uh, through for four years, 
be pouring water on these relationships and continuing to build it. Build trust where they're voting Republican because they're not happy with the Democrats and they believe that if they vote Republican, their lives will get better. One, you can't just assume that. One early indication that you were running a different kind of campaign with a different kind of energy was when you went on the popular radio program, The Breakfast Club. Uh, this was a time when, uh, you know, it was early days. I think there was a lot of skepticism about, you know, the kind of campaign um, you could run. But that was a segment, if I recall correctly, that just kept getting extended and extended and extended. And you're dealing with folks who did not necessarily share your ideological priors. Uh, but I wonder, did you get, if you could tell the audience a, a little bit about that experience and, and whether or not you think it paid some dividends to, to go before that audience? Oh, yeah. No, it definitely did. I, I still get good feedback from the Breakfast Club interview. Uh, it was supposed to be 20 minutes. And I don't remember how long it lasted. It was like definitely over an hour. And actually, one of the DJ Envy, one of the three, uh, actually had to leave right before the last question to go pick up his kid. He's like, I, like we were in the middle of live <laughs> recording. He's like, I don't know when you all are going to end. I'm out of here. <laughs> The, uh, the, the one thing that never actually ended up happening, much to the disappointment of some, back in 2008, I ran for Congress. And I was on a station, Party 105, DJ Vic Latino. And he did like a 20-minute interview. And it was probably one of the most boring interviews they've ever had on their radio station. Uh, it's not a radio station for political conversation. And about 20 minutes in, Vic Latino says, you know, I live in your district, but I have to admit, I'm not sure whether I'm going to vote for you. So we're going to have to have a sing-off. Uh oh, I do not have a good voice. I did join chorus to pick up girls in the 10th grade, but it wasn't for my singing voice. So they start playing the intro beat to a song called Big Pimpin' by Jay-Z. Now listen, I'm 27 years old at the time. And in my defense, as a 27-year-old, uh, I knew the words to two different versions of this song. There's a version of this song that you can play on the radio, and there's a version of the song that you cannot play on the radio. And as this long intro is going on, my inner political consultant is telling me, whatever you do, do not go with it. And as soon as the intro was up and it was time to uh, share the lyrics, I rapped Big Pimpin' by Jay-Z live on Party 105. <laughs> and after it was over, my team was saying, like, how can you do that? That's not very congressional. As if, like, I just ruined the campaign. Well, listen, we're polling 41 points down anyway. <laughs> There's not much to lose. It actually proved to be one of the best moments of that campaign. Uh, volunteer recruitment, low-dollar donation, word of mouth, creating a buzz. Just showing up at Breakfast Club to be willing to answer any question that they had on any topic. The only regret. You're willing uh, to be grilled. The only re totally. You can ask me whatever you want. Uh, the only regret by some of my team was that they were wondering whether or not I was going to uh, be busting out Big Pimpin' by Jay-Z. Now, this is a little different. I'm in my fourth term in Congress, and I'm now a candidate for governor. So you could debate whether or not that's a good idea. And the other thing is I do a pretty mean shaggy impression. <laughs> So they were actually, someone on the team was hoping that that, would, uh, that that would get out there. So during this conversation, it was supposed to be 20 minutes, we're now passing the one hour mark. And there's a lot of people listening to The Breakfast Club. And by the way, if you are running for governor of the state of New York, and you are unwilling to go there and answer whatever questions they have, you shouldn't deserve, you don't belong as governor of the state of New York. Because I, unlike Kathy Hochul, who in August said that I should get on a bus and move to Florida, she actually said it out loud. For me, I was running to be the governor for all New Yorkers. Now, part of it has to do with some of the engagement that is non-substantive, like I just described. Part of it is they want to know, what are you going to do to combat mental health, housing, upward economic mobility, making streets safer? We have all the solutions to do that. The Manhattan Institute, by the way, shout out for the Manhattan Institute. Going into the home, going into the home stretch of this campaign, one of the very most productive things that I did 
was coming into the Manhattan Institute office. The, the, the table was filled with Manhattan Institute experts. And we went topic by topic. We were there for a long time. Topic by topic by topic. Sharing ideas on what I could do to be a better, more effective candidate. And I have no idea how you know, the, you know, the, the sausage is made and raising the money to pay for this entire staff. But on this end of it, I will tell you that it made me a better candidate. It, it made me a better congressman. It would have made me a better governor. And my first thought I decided was this. If we're successful in winning this race, because we have to hit the ground running and prepare for a state of the state and prepare for a budget to be able to staff up thousands of positions uh, throughout New York, right out of the gate, right after the election, I, I was planning on contacting the Manhattan Institute and be like, OK, let's do this. I wanted to run New York with the Manhattan Institute. So if we were to talk about, if we were to talk about what to do for the next four years, no one asked me to say this. I am not on the staff of the Manhattan Institute. <laughs> I don't get paid for fundraising. But whatever you could do for the next four years to grow, to support this organization, I think it is critically important to be able to, success, to set up your candidate for success, not just as a candidate, but as an effective governor to actually turn us around. Let's, um Thank you for that, um, uh, Mr. Zeldin. Um, throughout your campaign, you were laser focused on crime and public safety. Now I wonder, you know, that was as a statewide candidate. You've also served in Congress for some time. You really were the majority maker in the House. You know, I, you won't say that, but I will. When you're thinking about what Republicans in Congress, what conservatives in Congress can do to shape urban violence, to combat urban violence. What do you think is appropriate? Now, of course, you know, we, we're federalists, right? You know, we believe in state and local control, but do you think that there are things that Congress can and should do to help reverse that tide? First off, showing up. We don't show up. By the way, we do field hearings. Why aren't you doing a field hearing on crime back in Morris Heights? Or anywhere else throughout the five boroughs. I feel like uh, Congress's functions are split primarily amongst two parts, oversight and legislation. From the oversight standpoint, you can try to get creative. A lot of the oversight uh, investigations that are being launched right now aren't necessarily as much about oversight over other levels of government. It's more about oversight over this executive branch. I would say from the legislative uh, standpoint, finding, uh, finding ways to, de to, to deal with particular challenges that are trickling down to the local level. We're seeing a strain right now on shelters, on education, on housing. What's Congress going to do? to help secure our border. The debate over border security, over the remain in Mexico policy, over catch and release of supportive customs and border patrol of incentives and rewards that are encouraging people to enter this country illegally. Well, Congress has a really important role on oversight and legislation. What are we going to do from the crime standpoint as it relates to fentanyl and other uh, and crystal meth and, over, and other abuse that's taking place. What can Congress do? I would say that wherever you can find that, that overlap, that it trickles down. But ultimately, a lot of my approach towards crime is from the bottom up. A lot of it has to do with elected officials at the most local level speaking up. There is a massive anti-Semitism problem on the streets of New York City. And how many politicians are silent about it altogether, and we've lowered our standards to the point where if they put a tweet out, we're like, oh, thank God, look at this progress. They posted a tweet. We have anti-Asian hate, where people are not just being targeted with a little bit of violence. We're talking about being pushed in front of an oncoming subway car, stabbed to death in their apartment in Lower Manhattan, beaten to the death on the streets with a hammer. 
We have district attorneys getting elected to office on pledges to represent the criminals over the law-abiding New Yorkers. And where's the rest of the politicians to speak up on behalf of those who feel like they're not in charge of their streets anymore? You're concerned about lack of money in the MTA? You want to impose congestion pricing? Well, how about you get more money in the MTA by improving the experience? More people enjoy the experience, more people want to ride the subways again. You want hundreds, you want, a, you want a few hundred million more? Well, enforce fare jumping. People should actually pay. And if for some reason you're making some argument that there are individuals who can't afford to ride the subway, well, you can still get them a card that they're swiping. Everyone needs to be using the turnstile. And those metrics are important. You need to know how many people are coming on, what the, the right timetable it is for uh, for usage, when the subways are going to be you know, in need of or not in need of uh, changes in schedules. So if you were to ask me really what do I think should be done by elected officials, yeah, Congress has some stuff they could do. Showing up in the oversight, doing the field hearings and some of the legislative issues, some of the, the challenges that trickle down to the local level. But crime fighting starts from the bottom up. And quite frankly, I don't think that Congress can do any better job of securing the streets of New York than at the city level they can do themselves. The last I would say, though, is this isn't just about the city. When Eric Adams says to Albany that we need to give judges discretion to weigh dangerousness, not only does he get stonewalled, they personally attack him. They'll go on social media and Danny O'Donnell, a white, liberal, Manhattan Democrat Assemblyman went after New York City's black mayor to suggest that the reason why Eric Adams is calling for judges to have discretion, suggesting that Eric Adams is racist. He actually posted this on social media. He said, dangerousness is code for black. Now, Eric Adams was elected due to a swing on the crime issue, in my opinion. When he started his race, crime was you know, coming right off the George Floyd um, murder. You have the riots taking place, the, you know, the BLM protests. Crime was different in June of 2020 than it was in June of 2021. By June of 2021, now crime is back up there at the list, but it's because people want to support our men and women in law enforcement. They want these streets safer. Now, Eric Adams knows this, and he gets a mouthful, I'm sure, by some of you all the time. Like, listen, you need to be courageous. You need to stand up for us and stand up to those politicians in Albany. You want to support Kathy Hochul. She's in your party. Okay, I get it. But you know what? The election's over. Now you have to do the right thing. We have to have his back when he's willing to do the right thing because he's getting personally assaulted with these attacks by people in his own party. And we also have to challenge him to stand up because he doesn't get some free pass. The honeymoon's over. Sorry, Eric Adams. Mayor Adams, and we served together for four years. We've stayed in touch since. Uh, we get along well. His honeymoon is over. He had a honeymoon, and it was extended. It was extended because of the different factors, like I told you. But now the election's behind us. I want Eric Adams to fiercely and consistently be out there publicly, standing there defending us, to be telling Albany what they need to do. Amend, raise the age. Overhaul, cash, less bail. And you know what the rest of us then have a responsibility to do? The rest of us have a responsibility to have Eric Adams' back. If he does the right thing, I am all in in having his back. If he doesn't, we can't have his back because the honeymoon's over. We have to challenge him and we have to push him to do it. He's in a really tough position. But quite frankly, the future of the Big Apple is depending on him stepping up more than ever before. With, with all due respect, we need Eric Adams to step up more. And it's just because, hey, you signed up to be the mayor of New York City.
Uh, before we turn to questions from the audience, I have one more question for you. It's, it's a more of a policy question. Uh, you were very focused, in addition to crime and public safety and public order, you were very focused on the quality of life and cost of living challenges that have contributed so mightily to the out-migration crisis facing the state. Uh, you know, to the fact that there's so many families at the bottom of the economic ladder who are finding it exceedingly difficult to climb. Now, one big driver of that, many in this room would argue, is housing costs. And Governor Hochul has seemed to make the case that you know, she's going to be really focused on this. She's going to be focused on building more housing. She also seems to be on the cusp of moving towards more stringent rent regulations and what have you. I wonder, for you as someone who is a, you know, a conservative who cares deeply about economic freedom, uh, you know, I wonder what would your playbook be on housing? Because in addition to being someone who cares about economic freedom, you're also someone who represented a suburban Long Island district where there are a lot of folks who are very concerned about the idea of rolling back land use regulations and what have you. They're very concerned about seeing their neighborhoods change dramatically. So I wonder how do you balance those considerations when you think about the yearning need we have in the city and the region for more housing? Well, first off, I oppose universal rent control. If it passed, if I was governor, I'd veto it. Uh, I do believe that New York City needs some type of form of 420A uh, to be able to, to, to come back. We need to make use of a whole lot of empty apartments right now into the tens of thousands. Talk about building new stuff. What are we gonna do to make sure that we're utilizing what we have here currently? Uh, the governor's state of the state, where she was putting out her housing plan, she was essentially declaring war on the suburbs. We lead the entire country in out-migration. I said for months during this campaign that in order to actually reverse us leading the entire country in population loss, we need a governor who understands why it is that we lead the country in out-migration. And I asked Kathy Hochul to finish this sentence. New York leads the nation in population loss because. She would never answer it. There was one time that a reporter in Binghamton Airport asked her this question, and she was stumbling all over this. I brought it up again at the one debate that we had. I wish we had five debates, 10 debates. We had one. I brought it up there. The reason why New York leads the entire nation in population loss is because New Yorkers look at other states, they believe their money will go further, they will feel safer, they will live life freer in Florida, Texas, the Carolinas, Tennessee, or elsewhere. Why do businesses leave? Why aren't businesses coming to New York? It's not a head scratcher. We have a bad business climate. They go to Texas, you don't have to offer them bribes in order to get them to come. They come because a good tax environment, a good regulatory environment, and you have state agencies supporting business as opposed to prosecuting them. We've gotten to the point in New York where businesses will only come to New York when the state is essentially offering them massive bribes. We're not offering them any of the other stuff and we have a bad business climate. So when you assault the suburbs the way Kathy Hochul proposed, you have people who already have a, a reason to leave. They already have family members who have left. Maybe they were already thinking about leaving. You're putting them over the top. I come from a town called Brookhaven. When I'm down in Washington, D.C., people would say, well, where's the first congressional district of New York? I would say that I have the district with the Hamptons in it. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. I live in a small town just west of the Hamptons called Brookhaven. Never heard of it. Even though the population has 500,000 people in it. Now, Kathy Hochul is the governor. She's not the town supervisor. She is not a county executive. She is not a monarch. She has no other position other than the governor of the state of New York. But what she's proposing to do is replace local control with Hochul control. And people who like the identity of their suburbs, she's proposing as part of her housing plan to change the suburbs from Albany to tell the people in these local areas what their suburbs have to look like. So I actually emphatically oppose, out of the gate, her housing plan that she put out seeking to change this zoning. It is a bad idea. Inside of the city, uh, the reality is that we do need more housing. And I would also offer for some people who live in the city who want to find additional housing opportunities, there are opportunities outside of the city. 
And I can introduce you to someone who wakes up every single day, drives 20 minutes to the Ronkonkoma train station, rides the subway into work, gets in the subway to get to the office from there, does it early in the morning, gets back home late at night and has kids at home. And they've been doing it for a really, really long time. The idea that you are entitled to stay inside of New York City and that in some cases you're able to squat inside of your property to the point where you're telling the owner of the building that if you want to get me out, you have to pay me $80,000. Wait, you want me to pay you $80,000 to get out of a property that I own? I think that there just needs to be a lot more reality in how we approach this. And it's everything from getting away from this idea of, oh no, we need more rent control. We need universal rent control all throughout the entire state. And we need to take over zoning in the suburbs. Now, Albany is not going to get this right any better than just having local control and also people understanding that this sense of entitlement where you can squat and you have to get bribed to get out of these spaces, I think we're uh, a bit inside out in our housing approach here in the state. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I see a hand in the middle of that row. Thank you. Um, given that you would, oh, thank Some you. Microphone. Given that you would most likely be our governor if you had voted differently on January 6th, do you regret your vote? No, and I, I disagree with the premise of that. Uh, next question. Uh, we have um, so, uh, a woman right over here. Um. First of all, thank you for what you've done for our state. And a day doesn't go by when I don't read the New York Post and I don't say, if only we had Governor Zeldin, we wouldn't have X, Y, Z. So, I, and with regard to that last question, I don't even know what that's about. But getting back to Hochul and Agenda 21, taking over our housing, our fear in the suburbs is, yes, she now has a plan that she will take over properties within, my understanding, half a mile near train stations and build multifamily housing. And even though that is not palatable to the residents, what I suspect she'll do is what she does with everything. She'll buy people off. She'll give millions for the school district. She'll have jobs for out-of-towners. She'll, she will essentially just keep flooding it with money that the Sorry, government- Sorry, I just want to make sure we get to a question. I'm sorry. So how can we really overcome this with her as governor, this Agenda 21 and what she's planning to do in the suburb? So the reality is, that you have a supermajority Democrat Assembly and Senate. That doesn't mean that every single piece of the agenda item of the, uh, the Democrats controlling Albany is going to get passed. So take inventory of what other tools you have available. Now, there are a whole lot of State Assembly and State Senate seats if you look at Suffolk, Nassau, Westchester, Putnam, Rockland, and by the way, I hear feedback on this proposal in other parts of the state. We're just talking about the New York City suburbs. You need every elected official, Republican and Democrat, to all be united and, and expressing that outrage of how we don't want Albany to change the identity of our town, of our county to the extent that you can get editorial boards to weigh in. Maybe you don't read that paper's editorial board or care what that newspaper's editorial board has to say, but there are people in Albany who do. Try to get maybe some of their support. Now, it's different to make a pitch to, you know, Nicole Gelinas or, you know, Michael uh, Goodwin or, you know, one of these others who write columns in the New York Post, try to get to everyone. There's an election coming up in two years, even though Hochul's not coming up in four years. And I think your best tool 
is to be sending a really strong message that you think you lost the suburbs in 2022? Just wait to see what happens in 2024 if you go forward with this particular proposal. You don't have the levers of power to stop this. But what you do have is your own voice, a whole lot of people who feel the same way, and mediums to help get the message and be relentless. You don't just, sometimes people do a protest and are like, okay, I did my part. One protest, a rally, a press conference. This is going to require, by the way, not only a strong mobilization uh, back home, but also bringing the, the masses up to Albany to let them know, like, there, if there is one thing that you absolutely do not pass that is in that top agenda, it is that change to zoning. Might be the only bet in this particular case if you want to take inventory of the strongest tools that you have. Um, we have a gentleman over here. Um, you had touched on ethnic minorities uh, essentially almost being taken for granted as a democratic voting base. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as a uh, politically conservative Jewish American, a uh, pet peeve of mine is that Jews have always been looked upon as being a very liberal voting base, when in fact, there's a very large divide between Jews who practice Judaism in some way, shape, or form in their daily lives and those who don't and the ones who do tend to be much more conservative. Uh, you have the likes of Ben Shapiro and uh, libs of TikTok creator Chaya Rachik and Mark Levinum on Fox News and yourself. And I just wanted to say that um, I took a great deal of pleasure seeing you at press conferences with Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan and so forth uh, representing us uh, in Washington and in the public arena. And I hope that you remain in public office. Um, any questions? Um, we have a um, gentleman over there. Do you think that given the uh, kind of political persuasions of uh, upstate New York versus New York City, that New York City should secede from uh, New York State? I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we have um, someone back there who's been waiting patiently, I believe. I'm also one of those people that you gave a lot of hope to that we hadn't felt in a long time, so thank you. My, que yeah. My question is, can you give us a sense, since we had all hoped you were gonna be governor, what are you gonna do for the next four years? To get, to get in my head a bit, when I look at New York electorally in a midterm, the turnout model changes if it's a midterm with a Republican president or if it's a midterm with a Democratic president. So one of the things that you can do to kind of handicap early, very early, of whether or not 26 is going to be a better opportunity or a worse opportunity if we were to finish what we started, which is a possibility. The question is, who's in the White House? Because 2018, with a midterm of a Republican president is very different than 2022 in the midterm with a Democratic president. So we'll see what 26 is. I have a good relationship with a lot of the Republican presidential candidates. I don't know who the nominee is. I don't know who's gonna win. We'll see whether or not there's a re-entry into government with a Republican getting elected president in 24. We'll see if there's a re-entry into government if we were to decide to run again in 26, or if we were to do something else. To give you a sense of how my days go, I spend my day fielding calls to run for Suffolk County Executive, New York Three, New York State Republican Party, <laughs> RNC, I was fielding speaker calls, Jill Brandon in 24, uh, you know, the list, the list goes on. And a lot of people, you know, they, they have ideas. And I, I love the passion. I, I, I like having the calls and just kind of talking through it. I enjoy government service. Um, I am in my 20th year in the, in the Army. 
I will tell you that as I was going through last week watching the floor of the House of Representatives, there was no piece of me that was upset that I was not on the floor <laughs> of the, the House of uh, Representatives. That, uh, By the way, I don't know if anyone on the floor, other than maybe some new member trying to take it in, if anyone really enjoyed that experience last week. Um, I am going to stay active in the meantime. Uh, I'm a week out of Congress and currently considering uh, many, many, many different opportunities. I will tell you that my daughters are right now in the middle of 11th grade. They're going off to college in a year and a half. And it is going to be my responsibility at this moment in time as a husband and as a father to not be bringing home government salary for a couple of years. However, what I am sure that I will do is to be carving out a very extensive amount of bandwidth just to try to be involved and help. I just want to do good things. I want to do my part to save this state and to save this country regardless of whether I'm in government or not. As far as what's next, short term, what's next, long term, don't know yet. But that gives you a little bit into my head as to what I'm thinking of the different opportunities that are out there. That brings us to the end of our formal program, everyone. Please join me in thanking Mr. Zeldin. And thank you also to Steve Klinsky for sponsoring this event. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, really, this, I found this incredibly inspiring. We're so grateful that you intend to remain a part of public life. And we hope to see you again. Sure.